Okay, hello and welcome to the review for the midterm exam for AHP 215. This is gonna represent about 95% of the material that'll be on the exam. So uh, hopefully you'll know the rest, but I uh, have to make sure I stress the fact that you do need to read the chapters. You have to read the textbook. Make sure you review back to the slides uh, that you have, as well as uh, any of the notes that you have. With that being said, I'm going to go through this and uh, highlight the things that I definitely want you to know about. So here we go. Uh, if you want, you can also hit the closed caption. And by hitting the closed caption, uh, what I'm saying will come up. And most of the time, the spelling is pretty correct. So that'll give you an opportunity to certainly go through and make notes. Uh, you can pause this at any time and stop and write notes. And I suggest that you do that because there's gonna be a lot of material here. Uh, this represents oh, about six weeks worth of material. So uh, it's been narrowed down considerably. All right, so let's get started. Uh, the neuron, is the individual cell of the nervous tissue. It is the one that conducts the messages. It is considered the parenchyma of the nervous uh, tissue. Remember, there are lots and lots and lots of neurons, although there are even more neuroglia cells, but the neuron is the individual cell of the nervous tissue that actually conducts the messages. Something we talked about way back in the first week or so, two weeks, we talked about the pH of a solution. And we said that as the concentration of protons, those the H positive increases, the pH of the solution is actually going to uh, become more acidic, but the number is going to decrease. So we are going to see, as we put more and more protons into the solution, we're gonna see the number get lower, but the acidity actually will increase. It'll become more acidic. We also talked about uh, carbon to carbon bonds and carbon to hydrogen bonds. We said that we see these in compounds that are referred to as organic compounds when they have carbon to carbon bonds, carbon to hydrogen bonds. We also talked about water. And so water is a type of molecule called a polar molecule because it has the um, positive charges on one side, the negative charge on the opposite side. Uh, so it's a little bit lopsided in its charges overall. So that is considered a polar molecule. Water, kind of an important molecule. Uh, in fact, we talked a lot about water before. Uh, we talked about necrosis as being unscheduled cell death and apoptosis being scheduled cell death. Uh, when tissue and cells are damaged and dying, and die, we call that necrosis. That is a very loud process. Necrosis is always followed by inflammation. Remember, you cannot see inflammation, but you can see things that happen as a result of inflammation. The, it, the actual inflammation is occurring at the uh, microscopic cellular le level and protein level, but we can see the forces uh, that, that come after that, like the edema, the swelling, uh, as well as redness, and of course, the patient experiencing pain. Apoptosis, however, is a quiet process. Apoptosis meaning it is scheduled cell death. If a cell is no longer needed anymore, or if um, just old has to be replaced, the body's not going to respond to that. Uh, back to water, the passive movement of water across the selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solid concentration to an area of high solid concentration is something we call osmosis. That's, an, that's a very unique property of water. That's why uh, I put water sort of in its own special category as instead of in, including it in the macromolecules of nutrition, because it is so unique, I think it just deserves that extra little um, nod having its own, own place. <laughs> I said that there are, the body makes two things more than anything else, energy and proteins, mostly energy. And the three things involved in making energy are glucose, oxygen, and water. Those are sort of the, every cell defaults to glucose first as the energy source. With regard to proteins, I said they can be structural, build things like bricks. 
but they can also act as enzymes. Remember, enzymes are going to catalyze reactions. In other words, they're going to make a reaction that was probably going to happen anyway, and it just kind of guarantees that it happens. So an enzyme is a type of a protein that catalyzes reactions. Uh, back to the protons, I said uh, the hydrogen ion, when it loses its electron, the only thing really left is the proton. So oftentimes the proton will be um, written as an H with a plus sign. And that's just referred to as a proton. That is a hydrogen ion, H plus. The suffix, I think it's a suffix, Rhea, R-R-H-E-A, R-R-H-E-A, Rhea. That means an excessive flow or discharge, whether it's uh, diarrhea, gonorrhea, menorrhea, R-R-H-E-A, Rhea, means an excessive flow or discharge. This goes back to the general terminology. Uh, back around that same time, we talked about cavities and uh, the different cavities in the body. And the abdominal cavity is the one below the diaphragm. The thoracic cavity is above the diaphragm. The cranial cavity, of course, holds the brain. Spinal cavity holds the spinal cord. And some of the organs found in the abdominal cavity include the liver, largest solid organ in the body, the gallbladder, pancreas, the stomach is also one of those organs that are found in the abdominal cavity. Uh, and remember I said that you can kind of combine the, the, the abdominal cavity with the cavity below it and call the whole thing the abdominal pelvic cavity, just kind of makes it easier. In the cell section, we talked about organelles. Organelles are the tiny components inside of cells, each having different jobs to do, but all working together for the good of the cell, just like organs in our body, but these are small, so we call them organelles. And uh, we talked about how there are a couple of organelles that are involved in making proteins. Ribosomes make proteins. Well, they actually, I don't think I, I said they make them. I said ribosomes actually put proteins together. Um, they're like protein, manu not even manufacturing, they're protein stations where parts are brought from different areas and build the proteins together. So they're not like the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is like an entire uh, factory dedicated to making proteins. The rough endoplasmic reticulum makes proteins. The ribosomes, they make proteins, but they make them by putting pieces together. The pieces have to be brought to them. So they're kind of like assembly stations of proteins. If you want to say they make proteins, that's fine. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, I said, makes fats. Um, the nucleus is the brain of the cell. Of course, that is where the DNA is going to be found. If a cell has a nucleus, then there's going to be DNA. The cell I mentioned that doesn't have a nucleus is the mature red blood cell. Uh, so there's no nucleus, there's no DNA, which is why the life expectancy of a mature red blood cell is only about 120 days. The mitochondria. These are the energy plants of the cell. These are the places where energy is made, the ATP is made. Remember that it is across the inner membrane of the mitochondria where the ATP is created. Lysosomes are little digestive bags of enzymes that break things down. Most we talked about the Golgi apparatus, we said was a an area that kind of packs and ships things, packs, gets it ready for shipping out of the cell, adds a few little touches to it, like sugars or things. Plasma membrane. Plasma membrane has uh, a couple of purposes, three main purposes, really. It's going to act as the barrier that keeps things in the cell. We want to keep in the cell as well as um, not allowing other things into the cell. Remember I said once, something comes into a cell or leaves a cell, the inside of the cell becomes different. If the inside of the cell is different, something's gonna happen. So the plasma membrane, its main three functions are to act as a barrier or a wall to allow or not allow things to pass. And then because the plasma membrane has proteins and glycoproteins and proteoglycans that are sticking out of it in a very unique uh, structure for all of us, uh, the body uses these as antigens. These are 
what the body uses to recognize our cells from foreign cells. And the cell membrane also is involved in maintaining its shape. If a cell has to maintain a certain shape, uh, that's gonna be based on the cell membrane. And remember I said one of the main components of a cell membrane is cholesterol. Cholesterol is something that we do actually need and our body makes cholesterol. Uh, from cholesterol, we can make things like uh, cell membranes, but we can also make things like uh, steroid hormones, for instance. So they're necessary for that. Other things we talked about. Keratin. Keratin is a hard fibrous protein that is found in the skin. It is found in the hair. It is found in the nails. And that gives the strength to these areas, keratin. Uh, going to the some of the bones, we talked about uh, the bone in the lower arm that is on the thumb side. I put the thumb side in there. I guess I can do it with this hand. The lower arm on the thumb side, the lateral side, this, of course, is going to follow the thumb. So as the thumb twists like this, that bone is actually going to flip over. That is the radius. Remember, the ulna is on the pinky side. It's on the medial side of the lower arm, and it allows the arm to hinge. The humerus is the bone of the upper arm. It is not funny, but it is the humerus, and it is the bone that allows for all this different motion. So we talked about that. Okay. The ribs begin from the thoracic vertebrae. You'll remember that there are 12 thoracic vertebrae, 12 with the T, thoracic with a T, 12 thoracic vertebrae, 12 with the T, thoracic with a T. So if we have a rib extending from each side of each thoracic vertebra, in other words, each thoracic vertebra has a pair of ribs, that means there are 24 ribs total. 12 on each side, and we just number them right side, left side, top down, 1, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The first seven pairs of ribs are the true ribs because they are bone that attaches to cartilage that attaches to bone. Rib pairs 8, 9, and 10 are the false ribs because they are bone that attaches to cartilage that attaches to cartilage. And rib pairs 11 and 12 are also false ribs, but they are just bone that doesn't attach to anything. Those are called the floaters. With the skin, uh, the hypodermis is sometimes referred to as subcutaneous tissue. That is where we find that, those fat storing cells. Remember, we are well, not, by, by the time we're about five years old, we pretty much have all the fat storing cells we have. Those fat storing cells are called adipocytes. Those are the ones in the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, going to some of the chemistry, I think I said this before, Make sure that you know things like uh, the, the chemical abbreviation for sodium, potassium, iron, oxygen, nitrogen, some of the basic ones that you definitely need to know about. Hydrogen. Yeah, I think that was it. When it comes to bones, how many bones in the adult human body? Well, the number that we all agree upon is 206. The number we all agree upon is 206 bones in the adult human. When we're born, we have closer to 300 because uh, a lot of those bones are still cartilaginous and they have not fused together yet. Uh, but by the time we're adult, 206 is the number that we all agree upon on average. Uh, some things from medical terminology. We talked about uh, the suffix phobia. A phobia is an irrational fear of something, not just a fear, it's an irrational fear, a phobia. Uh, another suffix, itis, I mentioned before, itis means inflammation of, that is something that you see a lot of, and a prefix dis, D-Y-S, difficult, painful, or abnormal. I said that this is one of the most important prefixes you will ever learn because pretty much everything in the body at some point in time can be difficult and or painful and or abnormal. So you'll see a lot of diseases that begin with dis. 
let's see, some bones, uh, bones of the cheek right here. These are the zygomatic bones. These are the only Z named bones in your body, zygomatic bones. But remember I said, don't rely on just knowing that it's a Z bone because I'm gonna put other words in there that begin with Z. So you actually have to know the name. The lateral cheek bones are the zygomatic bones. In the nervous system, the blood brain barrier I said was made up of those neuroglia cells called astrocytes. Astrocytes have radiating branches, which remind me of stars. And I said that uh, I think of the blood brain barrier is made up of these star shaped cells that even kind of looks like the letter A. And they separate the blood from the brain, astrocytes. I think of all the neuroglia cells, those are important to know about, as well as. Uh, the Schwann cells and the oligodendroglia cells. Remember the Schwann cells and the oligodendroglia cells are the ones that make uh, melanin. No, sorry, myelin. Myelin is that sh sheath, that covering, that insulation, if you will, that surrounds the axon of the neuron. And the Schwann cells are the cells that make myelin in the peripheral nervous system. And the oligodendroglyocytes or oligodendroglial cells are the cells that make the myelin in the central nervous system. So one of the best ways for best things to do to memorize that is simply put oligodendroglyocyte on one side of a note card and central nervous system on the other side. And then get another note card and put Schwann cell on one side of the note card and then peripheral nervous system on the other side of the note card because even if you're not completely sure of what they do, uh, at least you'll know where they do it. But those are the ones that make that myelin insulation uh, that goes around the neuron, around the axon. And they do it in a similar way, uh, not quite exactly the same. The Schwann cells kind of wrap them whole, their whole self around uh, the axon of a neuron, kind of like uh, those rubber parts wrapped completely around this pen. As compared to the oligodendroglia cells, they kind of wrap a little bit of one part of themselves around the axon of one cell and a little bit of one part of themselves around another one. Speaking of the nervous system, uh, we talked about how it is divided in central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, then some divided into the uh, somatic portion, which does things voluntarily, and the autonomic portion, which does things automatically. And I said that uh, the autonomic portion of the peripheral nervous system is then further subdivided into the sympathetic uh, division and the parasympathetic division. And most of the time we are running on parasympathetic division. That is the rest and digest. The sympathetic division uh, is the one that is involved in fight or flight when some sort of emergency happens uh, or the person is suddenly is being chased by a bear. Uh, I have sympathy for them if they're being chased by a bear because bears are scary. So the sympathetic, sympathetic division of the autonomic portion of the peripheral nervous system is the fight or flight, the sympathetic. Okay. Uh, the muscle that bends, the, or turns the head to the center and bends it down just a little bit. This is sometimes called the prayer muscle. It is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Remember, it has two places where it begins, on the sternum and on the clavicle, that's the clido, sternocleido, and then it inserts on that bony projection just behind your ear, the mastoid process. Sternocleidomastoid, sternocleidomastoid, sternocleidomastoid. Sometimes called the prayer muscle because it brings your head to center and down just a bit. And of course, there's one on either side. It's also used as a landmark, so that's why it's an important muscle to know about. Another important muscle, really important, is that dome-shaped muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity, and that is called the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle that flattens out. Now, I'm exaggerating, but it goes from being dome-shaped to less dome-shaped. And when that happens, that's going to cause the air pressure inside of our lungs to become lower than the air pressure of the outside world. So air is going to come rushing in. In other words, this is how we breathe air in. By that diaphragm contracting, that causes air to come rushing into our lungs. And then it 
air, air will passively move back out as the diaphragm relaxes again. The, another important muscle we talked about in the big muscle is the one of the lower leg in the posterior aspect of the lower leg. This is the muscle that puts us up on our tippy toes or as we say, plantar flexes the foot. foot. Plantar flexing is gonna push the toes down. Dorsiflexion is gonna push the toes upwards like this. So this is, this is my foot. This is going to plantar flex the foot. And the name of that muscle is the gastrocnemius muscle. I said, don't confuse that one. Just because it has gastro at the front of it, you automatically might think it has something to do with the stomach. But in this case, it's actually the muscle of the calf, the main muscle, the big muscle of the calf, uh, the gastrocnemius muscle, or some for some reason, the, the, leg, the leg stomach. Uh, the soleus is the smaller muscle of the calf, but that one I'm not as concerned about. The gastrocnemius muscle is the big muscle of the calf that is going to plantar flex the foot. And the calcaneal tendon is also known as the um, Achilles tendon. That is the tendon that attaches to the big heel bone of your foot. That tarsal, tarsal bone um, is called the calcaneus, that big heel bone. Talk, we talked about that. A word that we saw a lot in the muscle and we'll see in other areas around also is the word rectus. Rectus is a Latin word that means straight. So for instance, the rectus abdominis muscles are the ones in the center that go straight up and down. So anytime you see the word rectus, that is a Latin word that means straight. Good to know. Let's see, uh, some prefixes that you should know, some more prefixes is an, a-n, or sometimes just the letter a. That is a prefix that means without or not, like in the word anesthesia. If we break down the word anesthesia, it ends in an ia, the suffix, that means a condition. An means without, and anesthesia, anestheso means feeling or sensation. So the definition of anesthesia is a condition without feeling or sensation. Uh, hyper, hypo, remember I said don't, don't confuse these two. I don't think you will though if you think of hyperactive children. Hyper means above or more than normal. Hypo means below or deficient. And make sure that when you use these terms, you enunciate them clearly so that we know the difference between uh, hyperthermia, hypothermia, hypertension, hypotension, important uh, considerations. I've also talked about uh, sugars and enzymes. And I said, if you see sugars like glucose, fructose, sucrose, gluco, glucose, galactose, uh, they all have something in common, common. They all end in ose. That's how you can tell it's a sugar. It ends in ose, O-S-E. It's a sugar. However, if you look at enzymes like lactase, uh, peptidase, protease, anytime you see an enzyme, it is going to end in A's, A-S-E, or if you see a word ending in A-S-E, A's, you know it's an enzyme. So helpful hints to know. Okay. More things. The part of the cerebrum, that's the most obvious part of the brain, that is involved with subjective experiencing, objective expression of emotion is called the limbic system. This is something straight out of your textbook. The limbic system is the collective name, the name for the collective parts of the brain that work on emotion, basically. Uh, another term that I think was in the slides uh, is aphasia, is a type of language deficit. There's actually different types of aphasia, but when a person is unable to articulate words, uh, but they still make sounds, say that's aphasia. Another thing that was out of the textbook, the word consciousness, and actually out of the, out of the slides as well, I believe, consciousness, consciousness, the state of awareness of oneself. Consciousness, the state of awareness of oneself. Consciousness. Uh, we talk about fats. And I talked about the difference between um, saturated fats and unsaturated fats. 
first of all, saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Unsaturated fat, unsaturated fats are fluid at room temperature. Those are the good ones. Those are the ones we want. We want the unsaturated fats. In fact, the more unsaturated, the better. So a uh, fat that has a lot of unsaturation would be called a polyunsaturated fat. Poly means much or many, remember? So we want those fluid fats. We don't want those saturated fats. Saturated fats means that all of their carbons are completely occupied uh, by hydrogens in those uh, fatty acid chains stemming from that glycerol backbone. So the saturated fats are completely saturated. They have uh, hydrogen stuck everywhere. Hydrogens can stick on those uh, carbon on those carbon um, atoms. One thing that was in the textbook that you definitely need to know about, and, and I don't know if it showed up in the slides or not, but you definitely need to know about Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease results from some insufficient amount of dopamine, probably acetylcholine, being released from the substantia nigra. Uh, so patients will end up showing or demonstrating the shuffling gait, but they're walking. The gait is a person's walk, G-A-I-T. Uh, and you'll see a sort of shuffling their feet along, or they'll also experience what's called intention tremors. So as they go to pick something up, you'll watch their hands sort of shake more and more as they get closer and closer to it. Parkinson's disease, result of insufficient amounts of dopamine, and probably acetylcholine, but insufficient amounts of dopamine, specifically being released from the substantia nigra. In the cerebrum, we know that the cerebrum is broken apart. No, not broken apart. I don't want to call it that. I don't want to say it like that. The cerebrum is uh, named in different areas according to the bone that sits on top of them. In other words, we have a frontal lobe of the brain, of the cerebrum, excuse me. We have two parietal lobes. We have uh, two temporal lobes and we have the occipital lobe. The frontal lobe of the cerebrum this one is important because it is really what has made us so successful as organisms. Uh, it is going to help be responsible for predicting the benefits and consequences of future actions. So I think the example I usually give is if you're walking down the sidewalk and there's a section of pavement missing, uh, you have options where you could try and step down into the hole that is there, or you could jump across the, the hole in the, in the sidewalk, or you can walk on one side, which might put you closer to traffic, or you walk on the other side, which makes you walk in somebody's yard. But your brain goes through all these possible scenarios and then decides which is going to be the best outcome. Uh, and of course, walking around it away from traffic is kind of probably gonna be the best outcome. So the frontal lobe is what predicts this, the benefits and consequences of future actions. The, the diencephalon is an inner portion of the brain where we find the uh, thalamus, which is a main relay center, the hypothalamus, uh, a major, major control center that really sets the tones for a lot of the things in the body. And then the pineal gland, sometimes called the pineal body or pineal gland or pineal body. And the important thing about the pineal gland, this is what regulates the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is the wake sleep cycle. So it releases a hormone called melatonin. Don't confuse that with melanin. Melatonin. Melatonin is the hormone that is going to make us sleepy. So one of the things that really drives this is sunlight. So in this winter time where we have less sunlight, there's actually going to be an increased release of melatonin. In other words, you're gonna be sleepy more. And then when the spring comes and the days become longer and we get more sunlight, then the pineal gland is not activated and there's less melatonin, so you feel awake more. Uh, this is also something that is sold over the counter as a sleep aid. Please realize that this is not a sleep aid like an Ambien 
or a, uh, even Benadryl. This is not something that you take one time because you want to go to sleep and it makes you go to sleep. As a supplement, it actually helps to regulate it. So it's something that takes you take over time to help regulate that circadian rhythm. But the pineal gland regulates the circadian rhythm through the release of melatonin. And that is found in the diencephalon, the posterior aspect of the diencephalon. Talking more about the cerebrum, the occipital lobe. If you remember where the occipital bone is located, the occipital bone is here in the posterior aspect, but also extends all the way underneath and actually creates much of the floor of the cerebrum. Sorry. Much of the floor of the cranium. Uh, the cranium is a part of the skull that holds the brain. And in the occipital bone, in the occipital bone, we find this big hole, which is where the spinal cord meets the brain stem to meet the brain. And that big hole is called the foramen magnum. Because remember, the word foramen means hole, and magnum means big. So they just call this the big hole, the foramen magnum. And that is the hole in the occipital bone. So when we look at the cerebrum part of the brain, uh, the this lobe that is found here is called the occipital lobe. So, and that is actually where vision takes place. Vision takes place way back here in the occipital lobe of the brain. This is why I like to say that it's like having eyes in the back of your head, because if you've heard that saying before, um, it helps remind you that vision takes place back here that lobe of the cerebrum, the occipital lobe. Uh, as I said, the spinal cord meets the brain stem, which meets the brain up through that foramen magnum. The three parts that make up the brain stem going from top to bottom are the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Mm. The midbrain is where we find that substantia nigra. Uh, the pons is in direct communication with the cerebellum. Uh, so it out, helps out a lot with posturing, sending the signals concerning posturing. And then, <coughs> excuse me, it's also a Latin word that means bridge, pons. It kind of makes sense bridge between those areas. And then the medulla oblongata, that is a control center for a lot of homeostasis uh, throughout the body on a moment-to-moment on a -moment basis. There's a lot of information in, helps make decisions about what to do. As the spinal cord descends, it ends right about the level, well, sort of ends, right about the level of lumbar vertebra number one. <coughs> Excuse me where it branches off into a bunch of nerves, kind of resembles a horse's tail, which is why that area is called the cauda equina. Cauda equina, C-A-U-D-A-E-Q-U-I-N-E, -E, the horse's tail. Meningitis. Meningitis is inflammation of the meninges, the meninges are the layers that go around the brain and the spinal cord. The outer, most durable, most protective layer of the meninges is the dura mater. The middle layer is the arachnoid mater, which has a very interesting spider web appearance beneath it called the subarachnoid space. And then, of course, the pia mater is the thinnest most inner lining of meninges. It's kind of shrink wrapped around the brain. So if that area becomes inflamed, it's called a meningitis, inflammation of the meninges. And then around the spinal cord, there's actually an additional area, sort of fat area, called the epidural space that is unique to the spinal cord. It kind of sits above the dura mater, 
Um, and this is where an anesthetic agent could be introduced in women while they are in labor and delivery, so for that epidural space. The fluid that circulates around the brain and spinal cord is called the cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, is made by the ependymal cells in the um, empty spaces called ventricles in the brain, and it circulates around the brain, delivering nutrients around the spinal cord. Here is something directly from the textbook, serotonin. Serotonin is a type of a neurotransmitter, mostly inhibitory neurotransmitter that is involved in things like uh, mood, emotions, and even sleep. So that goes straight out of your textbook. And that is definitely one of the neurotransmitters you should know about, serotonin. Mostly inhibitory neurotransmitter. We talked about how neurons communicate and the space that is in between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron is called the synaptic cleft. We we'll sometimes hear it called the synaptic gap, synaptic space. Um, but for this one, for this test, I want you to know there's a synaptic cleft. That was the space in between the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. Uh, something I think we, I spoke about very briefly in the notes, but it's a good thing to know about is the refractory period. The refractory period is the very brief period of time when a local area of an axon's membrane is going to resist uh, its ability for re-stimulation. And what that means is, what that means for the neuron and for the action potential is that it's going to allow the action potential to continue in one direction. Without that refractory period, uh, there could be the potential that an action potential would go backwards. So we have to have that little brief period of time um, when it's, when that, when that area uh, that is just depolarized is going to sort of have to say, wait a minute, give me a second before I can depolarize again. Okay, let's see, skin. Ah, the integumentary system. That is the system of the body that studies the skin, hair, and nails. That is the integumentary system. Make sure you know that. Bones in the hand, bones in the hand. There are this group of eight bones called the carpal bones. Remember for this class, I'm not making you know the individual names of them, but I do require that you know the names of those bones that are found right there that allow for this sort of different grip of ability of our hands. Those are the eight carpal bones. Remember in the foot, there are seven tarsal bones. In the hand, there are eight carpal bones. In the leg, there are two long bones in the lower portion of the leg. The large anterior or mostly anterior bone of the lower leg that articulates with the femur is called the tibia. The long, thin lateral bone that is the fibula. They do not rhyme. It is not tibia and fibula or tibula and fibula. The large anterior bone of the lower leg that articulates with the femur, that is the tibia. And it even sort of has a T shape to it. The long, thin, lateral bone of the lower leg. I was trying to think of another way to describe it. It's kind of awkward looking. Long, thin, awkward looking lateral bone of the lower leg. That is the fibula. The fibula. The long, thin, lateral bone. The fibula. Do not forget the vertebrae. There are seven cervical vertebrae, 
12 of the T thoracic with a T vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, five, five vertebrae in the sacrum that are fused together. Five fused together. I sort of make a cup shape because the sacrum sort of cups in the middle of that pelvis. The sacrum is five vertebrae fused together. And then the tailbone is the coccyx, C-O-C-C-Y-X, which is usually made up of four. So seven cervical, 12 with a T, thoracic with a T, five lumbar, five in the sacrum fused together, and the tailbone is the coccyx, C-O-C-C-Y-X. And again, usually made of four, not that you need to know that. There is a bone uh, above the laryngeal cartilage. That is the only bone in the body that does not articulate with another bone. That is the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is the only bone in the body that does not articulate with another bone. The hyoid bone, the only bone in the body that does not articulate with another bone. It's actually an attachment site for the tongue as well. Um, let's see, let me show it this way. In the skull, the jawbone, The jawbone is the mandible. This is the only movable bone in the skull. Because remember, all these other bones are fused together. The jawbone is the mandible, the only movable bone in the skull. Talked about the cervical vertebrae, there's seven of them. The clavicle. The collarbone, the clavicle, this is the only true S-shaped bone in the body. I know people will disagree. They'll say, well, wait a minute. What about those small bones inside the middle ear, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, especially the malleus? It kind of has a question mark shaped, more like that. The clavicle is definitely S-shaped. The cerumen. Cerumen, C E R U M E N, cerumen is the earwax. That's that sticky stuff that helps to keep particles and pathogens from going deeper and deeper into the uh, external auditory canal. As we talk, as we chew, the cerumen moves more and more laterally and collects more and more cerumen and debris along with it and pushes it to the outside. Something to know about. The skin, the skin is made up of three layers. Make sure you know uh, the layers. The epidermis is the outermost layer. It is the thinnest layer. It does not contain a blood supply. Important to know about, it doesn't contain blood supply, but it does have melanocytes. And melanocytes, these are the cells that make melanin. Melanin is the pigment that gives uh, the color to our skin, as well as to our hair and to our iris. And in our skin, it's gonna help to decrease the UV penetration down to those basal cells, the stratum basale cells, because those are the ones that are rapidly dividing. And we do not want uh, the UV radiation to get all the way down to those cells because that could cause a change in the DNA, which can cause a change in the developing cells which could turn into what we know as cancer. So cells change, we call that cancer. So the epidermis is the thin outermost layer made up of those different stratum layers. Uh, it gives that protection of the UV radiation so that it doesn't make it down. Sorry, the mel melanin is the pigment that is created from the melanocytes. And the melanin is what blocks the UV radiation from getting down to those cells in the stratum basale or the basal layer. You'll recall I said that we all have the same number of melanocytes. Uh, it's just about how much each one makes, um, which determines the pigment of our skin. The epidermis is the outermost layer. The dermis is the main layer of the skin. That's where we're gonna find all the blood, blood and the nerves and the hair and all that. 
And then below that is the hypodermis, which is also referred to as the subcutaneous tissue. This is where we find all the fat, those fat cells, those adipocytes. The adipocytes are the fat cells. Now remember, each fat cell can hold more and more fat, so each cell can get bigger, which of course means each area of fat tissue can get bigger. And that's all I have to say about that. Let's see, we talked about the limbic system. We talked about meningitis. Okay, I think that's everything. I think that's everything for the exam. So it's a lot of material, I know. Uh, but a lot of the stuff we've already talked about, a lot of these things you've seen on quizzes, um, you've already heard the stuff many, many times. So don't forget this stuff because you'll see some of this stuff again on the final exam. Uh, but there will be a review for the final exam as well. I think there actually already is a review for the final exam. So with that, I wish you luck. Uh, if you have any problems, let me know. Make sure to like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. You can always check out the description where I have a link to uh, my online store with fun sticker, t-shirt, and mug designs. All right. Good luck, and uh, I will talk to you soon. All right. Goodbye.